ह्यूमन आई एंड द कलरफुल वर्ल्ड द ह्यूमन आई इज एन अमेजिंग ऑर्गन दैट हेल्प्स अस टू सी द वर्ल्ड अराउंड अस इट्स लाइक अ सोफिस्टिकेटेड कैमरा विथ पॉट्स दैट वर्क टुगेदर टू कैप्चर लाइट एंड सेंड मेसेजेस टू आवर ब्रेन एलोइंग अस टू अंडरस्टैंड शेप्स कलर्स एंड मूवमेंट द रिजोल्यूशन ऑफ ह्यूमन आई इज कैलक्युलेटेड अबाउट फाइव सेवेंटी सिक्स मेगा पिक्सल्स द लेटेस्ट मोबाइल फोन्स मे हैव बेस्ट कैमराज बट देर रेजोल्यूशन इज नॉट इवन वन फोर्थ ऑफ द ह्यूमन आई रेजोल्यूशन लर्निंग अबाउट हाउ द आई फंक्शन नॉट ओनली टीचर्स अस अबाउट आर एबिलिटी टू सी बट ऑल्सो शोस अस हाउ इम्पॉर्टेंट आवर विजन इज फॉर एवरीथिंग वी डू फ्रॉम रीडिंग एंड प्लेइंग स्पोर्ट्स टू एंजॉइंग आर्ट एंड नेचर let us begin this chapter with structure and functions of the human eye parts of the human eye this is cornea this is iris this is crystalline lens this is pupil these are ciliary muscles this is aqueous humor this is vitreous humor this is retina this is optic nerve and this is blind spot now let us study each part in details cornea it is a thin transparent spherical membrane covering the front part of the eye light enters our eye through this membrane so it is the outer protective membrane of the eye crystalline lens it is also called as eye lens it is a soft and flexible jelly like material which is made up of proteins it is a convex lens and helps to focus images on the retina the lens are transparent and flexible that means the light can easily pass through them and at the same time their shape can be modified iris iris is a dark muscular diaphragm present between cornea and lens it controls the size of the pupil that means the iris can make the pupil big and small pupil it is a small hole through which the light passes it regulates the amount of light entering the eye when the light is low the pupil opens up completely to allow more light into the eye when the light is low the pupil opens up completely to allow more light into the eye that means when we enter a dark room then the light is very low we will not be able to see anything but after some time we will be able to see certain things that means our iris muscles they make the pupil big and allowing more light into the eye so when the light slowly enters our eye then we will be able to see the things even in low light in the same way when the light is bright very bright if the bright light enters the eye the inner parts like retina gets damaged so the pupil becomes very small and reduces the amount of light that enters the eye so the size of the pupil is controlled by the contraction and relaxation of iris muscles and this iris it adjusts the size of the pupil ciliary muscles these muscles hold the lens in position and help in changing the shape of the lens the shape of the lens or the curvature of the lens is modified by the action of these ciliary muscles next retina retina is a delicate membrane which consists of numerous light sensitive cells it acts like a screen the light that enters our eye it gets casted on this screen like structure called retina The cells in the retina are light sensitive cells. They get activated when light falls on them and these light signals are converted to electrical signals. That means the retina converts the light into electrical signals. The light sensitive cells of retina are of two types. One, rod cells, two, cone cells. Rod cells are responsible for vision in low light. That means they are helpful in the night time vision. cone cells are active at high light levels they also help us in recognizing the colors that means 
our daytime vision is mostly based on cone cells optic nerve it transmits the electrical signals that are generated by the cells of retina to brain so the electrical signals or the information that is collected by the eye is transferred to the brain through these optic nerves blind spot this is an area on the retina it is the place at where the optic nerve is connected to the eye that means at the blind spot the retina is connected to the optic nerve aqueous humor the space between cornea and eye lens is filled by a transparent liquid called aqueous humor it keeps the cornea moist and it also provides nutrition to the eye vitreous humor the space between the eye lens and retina is filled with a liquid called vitreous humor the vitreous humor helps the eye to keep its shape power of accommodation power of accommodation is the ability of eye lens to adjust its focal length the eye lens is made up of fibrous jelly like transparent material the change in the shape of the eye lens changes the curvature of the lens the contractions and relaxations of ciliary muscles can modify the shape of the lens to view the distant objects that means far off objects clearly the ciliary muscles get relaxed and the lens becomes thin then the focal length gets increased and we can see the far objects clearly so to see a far object the ciliary muscles must be relaxed when the ciliary muscles are relaxed then the lens become thin then the focal length gets increased and we will be able to see distant objects now to see the objects closer to the eye clearly so if the object is very close to the eye then the ciliary muscles contract so this increases the curvature of the eye lens then the eye lens becomes thicker and the focal length of the eye lens decreases this enables us to see the nearby objects clearly four point of the eye four point of the eye means maximum distance to which i can see clearly is called four point of the eye it is infinity for a normal eye for a normal eye the four point is infinity now near point of the eye the minimum distance at which an object can be seen clearly without any strain is called the least distance of distinct vision that means you will be able to see your notes or textbook at some distance from your eye if you bring your book close to the eyes then your vision will be blurred and your eyes feel some strain so at which distance you will be able to clearly see without any strain is the near point of the eye the near point for a normal eye of an adult is about 25 cm cataract for some people at their old age the crystalline lens becomes milky and cloudy this condition is called cataract so this cataract it causes partial or complete loss of vision so this can be corrected by a cataract surgery that is by the means of surgery they will remove the milky and cloudy parts of the eye lens we have two eyes for vision and not just one do you know why a human being has a horizontal field of view about 150 degrees with one eye and about 180 degrees with two eyes so this type of vision is called as stereotypic vision faint objects cannot be seen properly with a single eye so we need a pair of eyes for proper vision and we cannot get the depth perception also with single eye vision if we wanted to know the exact depth or the 3d view of an object we need to have a pair of eyes defects of human eye what is defective vision when a person cannot see the objects clearly and comfortably it is called as defective vision it happens when the power of accommodation of eye is reduced it leads to a blurry vision which causes strain to eyes the defective vision of human eye 
is mainly of three types: one, myopia; two, hypermetropia; and three, presbyopia. Let's see myopia. This defect of eye is called nearsightedness. Persons with this defect can see the nearby objects clearly, but cannot see the far objects clearly. We learned that the normal far point of human eye is infinite, but for myopic persons, the far point is less than the infinity. That is, in myopic persons, the far point will be only a few meters. So, if any object is beyond that limit, then they will not be able to see it clearly. So, so such condition is called myopia. Myopia means not able to see the far objects clearly. We know that when the image of an object is casted on the retina, then we will be able to see it clearly. But whereas in myopia, the image is casted in front of the retina, not on the retina. So this leads to blurry vision. Then how can we correct it? How can we make the image is casted on the retina? This can be done by using concave lens. Concave lens makes the image to fall on retina. So by that, the myopic person can see the four objects clearly. Then what are the reasons for myopia? There are two reasons for myopia. One, excessive curvature of the eye lens. So if the eye lens, it gets excessive curvature, then it leads to myopia. And second one is elongation of eyeball. So if the eyeball is elongated, then it also leads to myopia. Next one, hypermetropia. This defect of eye is called farsightedness. Persons with this defect can see the far objects clearly, but cannot see the nearby objects clearly. We learned that the normal near point of human eye is 25 centimeters. But for a hypermetropic person, the near point is farther away from 25 centimeters. That means beyond 25 centimeters. So at 25 centimeters distance, they will not be able to see it clearly. Their vision will be blurred. So when they read any book or they see their mobile phone, they keep them far away from their eye and try to read them. So hypermetropic persons always keep reading material much beyond the 25 centimeters from the eye for comfortable reading. This is because the light rays from the close by objects are focused at a point behind the retina. Then how this can be corrected? This can be corrected by using a convex lens. It makes the image to fall on retina. So by that the myopic person can see the nearby objects clearly. Now let's see the reasons for hypermetropia. There are two reasons for this defect. This defect arises either because of one, the focal length of the eye lens is too long or two, the eyeball has become too small. Next one, presbyopia. Presbyopia is the gradual loss of your eye's ability to focus on nearby objects. They find it difficult to see nearby objects comfortably and distinctly without corrective eyeglasses. This defect arises due to the gradual weakening of the ciliary muscles and diminishing flexibility of the eye lens. So here there are two reasons for this presbyopia. One, gradual weakening of ciliary muscles. So the ciliary muscles cannot contract and relax properly. So by that they will not be able to focus on the close by objects or nearby objects. And second one is the diminishing flexibility of the eye lens. So the eye lens are transparent and flexible jelly-like material. But due to with aging, they lose their flexibility. They become rigid. So due to this rigidity, the eye lens cannot adjust properly. In some cases, some people suffer from both myopia and hypermetropia. In such cases, bifocal lenses needed for proper vision. A common type of bifocal lenses consists of both concave and convex lens. The upper portion consists of concave lens. It helps in distant vision. And the lower part is convex lens. It facilitates near vision. These days, the refractive defects are corrected with contact lenses or through surgical procedures. Refraction of light through prism. This is a triangular prism. It has two triangular bases and three rectangular surfaces. These surfaces are inclined to each other. The angle between its two lateral faces is called the angle of the prism. Let us pass some laser light 
through this prism at some angle the light rays get deviated and emerges out from the other side now let us draw the normal for the incident ray and the emergent ray now this is the incident ray this is the deviated ray and this is the emergent ray now extend the incident ray and emergent ray they both meet at a point the angle of these two rays at this point is the angle of deviation dispersion of white light by a glass prism if we pass white light through a prism it splits into seven colors this is called dispersion of light the phenomenon of splitting of white light into its constituent colors when it passes through a prism is called dispersion do you know why we cannot see the different colors when the light is traveling in air or vacuum the light rays of different colors travel with the same speed in vacuum and in air so we do not see the colors separately but in other mediums they travel with different speeds and bend through different angles which leads to dispersion of light so when white light or sunlight is dispersed we will get a band of seven colors called as spectrum of sunlight they include violet indigo blue green yellow orange red simply called as vibzior isaac newton was the first to split the sunlight using a glass prism he placed a second identical prism in an inverted position with respect to the first one and allowed the spectrum to pass through it then he observed that a beam of white light is emerged from the other side of the second prism that means when a beam of white light is passed through a prism it split into seven colors and again when this spectrum is passed through a prism again it unites to form a beam of white light now let's see rainbow rainbow is a natural spectrum formed by raindrops it always forms opposite to the sunlight here the water droplets act as small prisms when sunlight hits the raindrops they refract and disperse the incident sunlight then they reflect it internally and finally refract it again when it comes out of the raindrop atmospheric refraction atmospheric refraction is the bending of light as it passes through the earth's atmosphere causing objects which are near to the horizon to appear slightly higher than they actually are atmospheric refraction means it is the bending of light when the light it passes through the earth's atmosphere so when the light enters from space to the atmosphere then there will be bending of light so this bending of light it causes it makes the objects appear slightly higher which objects the objects which are near to the horizon of the earth so the objects which are near to the horizon of the earth they appear slightly higher than their actual position so this is called as atmospheric refraction now let us see the effects of atmospheric refraction apparent position of the stars the apparent position of the stars refers to their observed location in the night sky that means that means in the night time we see the stars at a different position which is not their actual position why it happens like this is the original position of the star but due to the atmospheric refraction it appears to be at another position which is called as apparent position the density of the air near the earth is more to the density of the atmosphere towards the space as we go up in the atmosphere the density of the air decreases because due to the gravity the air is thick closer to the earth and the air is thin towards the space so the density of the air is more near the earth so this makes the refractive index of the atmosphere gradually increases top to bottom so the refractive index of the atmosphere it increases from top to bottom as the light enters into the atmosphere as it reaches the surface of the earth the refractive index of the atmosphere increases due to this changing refractive index the starlight bends towards the normal so because of this we see the star at slightly different position from its actual position the star appears slightly higher than its actual position when viewed near the horizon so the new position of the star is called apparent position of the star now let us see how the phenomena of twinkling of stars takes place the air in the atmosphere does not have the uniform temperature and density that means different layers of the air will have different temperature and different density
So different regions of atmosphere will have different refractive index because there is difference in their temperatures. This part of the air may have different temperature and this part of the air may have other temperature. So there is a difference in the temperatures and there is a difference in the density of the air. So all layers of the air do not have the same density. So the path of rays of light coming from the star goes on varying slightly. That means it is not passing in a straight line. Its direction slightly changes because of the changes in the atmosphere. Certain part of the atmosphere may be cold, certain part of the atmosphere may be hot. And even the densities of the atmosphere also may vary. So because of this, the light ray is changing its direction slightly. So the apparent position of the star fluctuates. The apparent position of the star it fluctuates because due to the differences in the atmosphere, temperature of the atmosphere. And the amount of starlight entering the eye, it flickers. So the star sometimes appears brighter and at some time fainter. This gives the twinkling effect. So what is the twinkling effect? The twinkling effect is that the stars appear like they are glowing and becoming dull glowing again. So this is the twinkling effect. So it happens because of the variations in the temperature and density of the atmosphere. If it is the case, then why don't planets twinkle? Why it is not applied to the planets? Planets do not twinkle like stars because they are much closer to Earth and appears as small extended disks rather than point source of light. Planets are not point source of light. So many points of light come from the planets since they are bigger and they are closer to the earth. They are not single point source of light. So this phenomena happens only in single point source of light. That is in case of stars. So in case of planets, the light coming from them consists of multiple points across their surface. So not a single point, multiple points. So the combined effect of all these multiple points of light helps to average out the atmospheric turbulence. So it cancels out the atmospheric turbulence because the light rays are coming from multiple points. So it results in a steadier and less twinkling appearance. So that is the reason why the planets do not twinkle whereas the stars twinkle. Advanced sunrise and delayed sunset. Let us see how this phenomena happens. When sun rises above the horizon, it is called as sunrise and when the sun downs below the horizon, it is called sunset. Then what is the horizon? The horizon is the line that separates the earth from the sky. When the sunlight enters the atmosphere, due to the atmospheric refraction, it bends and the sun becomes visible to us before crossing the horizon. So the sun is below the horizon. The sun did not cross the horizon, but still sun is visible to us. How? Because the sunlight it is bent in the atmosphere and we will be able to see the sun. So this is not the actual position of the sun. It is the apparent position of the sun. So due to the atmospheric refraction, the sun is visible to us about two minutes before the actual sunrise. So before the actual sunrise, two minutes before the actual sunrise, we will be able to see the sun because of atmospheric refraction. So that position of sun is called apparent position of the sun. And in the same way, and about two minutes after the actual sunset. So the sunset is done. Sun is down the horizon. But still we will be able to see because of the atmospheric refraction. That is, two minutes after the actual sunset, we will be able to see the sun. Scattering of light. When a particle comes in the path of a light ray, it gets reflected and scattered in all directions. So the reflection of light from an object in all directions is called scattering of light. So when a particle comes in the path of a light ray, when the light ray hits that particle, the light ray gets reflected in different directions. It is called scattering of light. So this scattering is responsible for blue color of the sky and reddening of the sun. Next, Tyndall effect. The Earth's atmosphere is a transparent medium in which particles like dust, smoke and tiny water droplets are freely suspended. So our atmosphere contains so many Particles like dust, smoke and tiny water droplets. So the atmosphere looks very clear, transparent, but still it contains so many particles like dust, smoke and tiny water droplets. When a beam of light passes through this medium, that light illuminates these suspended particles. That means the light makes these particles glow and suddenly they become visible to us. For example, in a closed room, if a beam of light is entering through a window, then you can see all the dust particles 
they are glowing they are illuminated so this phenomena was first observed by john tyndall hence it is named as tyndall effect so when a beam of light passes through a medium in which particles like dust smoke and tiny water droplets are freely suspended it illuminates these suspended particles this phenomena is called tyndall effect now let's see the color of sky sunlight is composed of spectrum of colors we know that so these spectrum of colors each light has got different wavelength these colors range from red with longer wavelengths to violet with shorter wavelengths so there is difference in the wavelength of these light rays red longer wavelength and violet with shorter wavelength when sunlight enters the earth's atmosphere it encounters tiny particles in molecules but here blue and violet light rays have shorter wavelengths are scattered more by these small particles so blue and violet they have very short wavelengths because of the short wavelength they are more scattered compared to the other light rays so blue and violet rays have shorter wavelengths are scattered more by these small particles and molecules than longer wavelengths like red and yellow as a result when sunlight enters the atmosphere the blue and violet wavelengths are scattered in all directions by these particles it makes the sky to appear predominantly blue during the daytime this is the reason why we see the sky in blue color actually there is no color but the blue and violet light rays they have since they have the shorter wavelengths they are more scattered by the dust particles present in the atmosphere other colors are not scattered that's why the sky appears blue because the blue light is scattered so that is the reason for the blue color of the sky if earth has no atmosphere then there would not have been any scattering then the sky would be look dark that is the reason why the sky appears dark to passengers flying at very high altitudes why stop signals and danger signals lights are red so we see the stop signals and danger signals they'll be usually in red color why is there any specific reason yes danger signal lights are red in color because red is least scattered light by fog or smoke particles so earlier we discussed it that the wavelength of red light is more so it is not easily scattered by the dust particles so therefore it can be seen in the same color even at large distance so this light is visible to large distances that's why red color is used for danger signal color of sun at sunrise and sunset sun gets a specific red color during sunrise and sunset why let's see the reason during sunrise and sunset light from the sun passes through a thick layer of atmosphere and larger distance before reaching our eyes when the sun is at horizon the sun rays they travel long distance in the atmosphere the path they travel in the atmosphere is very long when the light enters the atmosphere there most of the blue light of short wavelength is scattered away that means blue light is filtered from the light that comes the blue light is scattered and filtered so since the blue light is scattered away the other wavelength light reaches our eyes that means the red wavelength that means the red light reaches our eyes that's why the sun appears red during sunrise and sunset so this is all about human eye and the colorful world light reflection and refraction we all know that light is a form of energy we learned that light travels in a straight line light traveling as straight rays explains the phenomenon like reflection and refraction but it fails to explain the phenomenon like diffraction of light to explain this many theories have been put forward by different scientists let us know about the different theories of light the corpuscular theory the corpuscular theory of light proposes that light consists of tiny particles called corpuscles these particles travel in straight lines and bounces off surfaces explaining reflection this theory was originally proposed by sir isaac newton the wave theory of light it suggests that light behaves as a wave spreading out and interfering with itself this theory explains phenomena such as diffraction and interference it was primarily developed by christian huygens and next the quantum theory of light it suggests that the light is made up of tiny packets of energy called photons these photons have both particle and wave properties explaining phenomena 
like the photoelectric effect. This theory was developed by Albert Einstein and forms the basis of quantum mechanics. But in this lesson, we are going to study the reflection and refraction of light. For this, we consider the notion that light rays travel in straight line. What is reflection of light? When a light ray strikes a smooth polished surface like mirror, it bounces back. It is called as reflection of light. We can study the reflection of light with the help of mirrors. Mirror is an opaque object with shiny reflective surface. It is because of the reflection of light we will be able to see our images in mirrors. What is refraction of light? When a light ray passes from one medium to another medium, its traveling speed changes and results in change of its direction. This phenomenon is called refraction of light. A straw in a glass appears to be bent. This is due to refraction of light. We can study the refraction of light with the help of lens. Lens is a transparent object usually made of glass. Eyeglasses are the examples of lenses which use in our day-to-day -day life. First, let us study the reflection of light with the help of mirrors. This is a plane mirror. When a light ray strikes a plane mirror, it gets reflected back. According to the loss of reflection, the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. Image Formation Plane mirrors create virtual images that appear to be located behind the mirror at the same distance as the object in front of the mirror. These virtual images are not real. That means they cannot be projected onto a screen. They are formed by the apparent intersection of reflected light rays when extended backward. Size and Magnification The size of the image in a plane mirror is the same as the size of the object. There is no magnification, means that objects in a plane mirror appears to be the same size as they are in reality, laterally reversed. The images formed by plane mirrors are laterally reversed, also known as left-right reversed. This means that if you raise your right hand in front of a plane mirror, your image will appear to raise its left hand. Now, let us understand the reflection of light by spherical mirrors. A spherical mirror is a curved mirror and it forms the part of a sphere. Spherical mirrors are of two types. One, convex mirrors and two, concave mirrors. A convex mirror is a type of a spherical mirror that has an outward curved reflective surface. A concave mirror is a type of a spherical mirror that has an inward curved reflective surface. To understand reflection by a spherical mirror, we need to know certain terms. Pole. The center point of the reflecting surface of a spherical mirror is called pole. It lies on the surface of the mirror. Pole is denoted by letter P. Center of curvature. The center of curvature is the center of the imaginary sphere from which the spherical mirror is derived. It lies behind the mirror in case of a convex mirror and lies in front of the reflecting surface of a concave mirror. It is represented by the letter C. Radius of curvature. The radius of curvature or of a spherical mirror is the radius of imaginary sphere of which mirror is a part. Principal axis. The line joining pole and center of curvature is called principal axis. We should remember that the principal is normal to the mirror at its pole. That means at the point of pole, the angle between the plane of the mirror and the principal axis is 90 degrees. Principal focus. If a number of light rays parallel to the principal axis are falling on a concave mirror, they all meet or intersect at a point on the principal axis of the mirror. This point is called the principal focus of the concave mirror. In case of a convex mirror, the reflected rays appear to come from a point on the principal axis. This point is called the principal focus of the convex mirror. The principal focus is represented by the letter F, focal length. The distance between the pole and the principal focus of a spherical mirror is called the focal length and it is represented by the letter small f, aperture. The diameter of the reflecting surfaces of the spherical mirror is called its aperture. In this chapter, we are discussing about the spherical mirrors whose aperture is smaller than their radius of curvature. 
Let us see the relation between the radius of curvature and the focal length. The relationship between the radius of curvature R and the focal length F of a spherical mirror is as follows. For spherical mirrors with small apertures, the radius of curvature is found to be equal to twice the focal length. We write it as R equal to 2F or F equal to R by 2. This means that the principal focus of a spherical mirror lies midway between the pole and the center of curvature. Representation of images formed by spherical mirrors using ray diagrams. Rules for making ray diagrams. Parallel ray rule. For a concave mirror, if a light ray passes parallel to the principal axis, after reflecting, it passes through the focal point F. For a convex mirror, if a light ray passes parallel to the principal axis, after reflecting, it appears to come from the focal point F behind the mirror. Focal ray rule. For a concave mirror, if a light ray passes through principal focus, after reflection, it emerges parallel to the principal axis. For a convex mirror, if a light ray is directed towards the principal focus, after reflection, it emerges parallel to the principal axis. Center of curvature ray rule. For a concave mirror, if a light ray goes from the object to the center of curvature, after reflection, it retraces its path back to the center of curvature. For a convex mirror, if a light ray is directed in the direction of center of curvature, after reflection, it retraces its path back. 4. A ray incident oblique to the principal axis towards pole of the mirror is reflected obliquely on the concave mirror or a convex mirror, the incident and reflected rays making equal angles with the principal axis. First, let us draw some ray diagrams. Image formation by a concave mirror for different positions of the object. Case 1. If the position of the object is at the infinity, the position of the image will be at the focus F. The size of the image is highly diminished and point-sized. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 2. If the position of the object is beyond C, the position of the image will be between F and C. The size of the image is diminished. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 3. If the position of the object at C, the position of the image will be at C. The size of the image will be same as object. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 4. If the position of the object is between C and F, the position of the image will be at beyond C. The size of the image will be enlarged. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 5. If the position of the object is at F, the position of the image will be at infinity. The size of the image will be highly enlarged and the nature of image is real and inverted. Case 6. If the position of the object is between P and F, the position of the image will be behind the mirror. The size of the image will be enlarged and the nature of image is virtual and direct. Uses of concave mirrors Concave mirrors are used as shaving mirrors, dentist mirrors. They are also used in the reflectors of torchlights and vehicle lights. Now, we will see the image formation by convex mirror. Here we consider only two positions of the object for studying the image formed by convex mirror. Case 1. If the position of the object is at infinity, the position of the image will be at the focus behind the mirror. The size of the image is highly diminished and point-sized. The nature of the image is virtual and direct. Case 2. If the position of the object is between infinity and the pole of the mirror, the position of the image will be between P and F behind the mirror. The size of the image is diminished. The nature of the image is virtual and erect. Uses of convex mirrors. They are used as rear view mirrors in vehicles because they always forms an erect image and have wider field of view as they are curved outwards. Sign Convention for Reflection by Spherical Mirror The sign convention for spherical mirrors is a set of rules used to determine the sign, either positive or negative, of various distances and quantities involved. This convention is important for calculating the image distances, object distances and to find magnification.
object placement the object is always placed to the left of the mirror indicating that the light from the object approaches the mirror from the left side measurement from the pole distances parallel to the principal axis are measured from the mirror's pole the pole is the point where the mirror surface intersects the principal axis direction of measurement all distances measured to the right of the origin along the positive x axis are considered positive while those measured to the left of the origin along the negative x axis are considered negative this helps in determining the position of the object and image relative to the mirror height above the principal axis distances measured perpendicular to and above the principal axis along the positive y axis are considered positive this is used to determine the heights of the objects and images above or below the principal axis height below the principal axis distances measured perpendicular to and below the principal axis along the negative y axis are considered negative this convention ensures that heights below the principal axis are assigned negative values these sign conventions are fundamental for analyzing and solving problems related to spherical mirrors mirror formula and magnification the mirror formula is particularly useful for determining the position and characteristics of an image formed by a mirror the mirror formula is a fundamental equation used to relate the object distance u and the image distance v and the focal length f of a spherical mirror it is expressed as 1 by v plus 1 by u is equal to 1 by f where f is the focal length of the mirror v is the image distance means the distance from the mirror to the image and u is the object distance that is the distance from the mirror to the object magnification magnification refers to the ratio of an image to the height of an object it is denoted by letter m that means it is the comparison of the size of the image with respect to the size of the object that is height of the image h dash by height of the object h means m is equal to h dash by h the height of the object should be taken as positive since it is usually placed above the principal axis the height of the image should be taken as positive if the image is virtual and should be taken negative if the image is real that means if the image is on the side of the object we can also find magnification by comparing the image distance and object distance we know that image distance means the distance between the mirror and the image and object distance means the distance between the mirror and the object so magnification is equal to image distance by object distance that means m is equal to minus v by u let us try to solve a problem based on above mirror formula an object of 6 cm height is placed at a distance of 12 cm in front of a concave mirror of focal length 24 cm find the position nature and size of the image first let us draw a rough diagram with the values given for a better understanding this is the position of the object with 6 cm height and the distance between the object and the pole is 12 cm the focal length is 24 cm so we have focal length and object distance here while writing the values of focal length and object distance we have to take them as negative because as per the sign convention the focal length is on left side of the mirror so it is a negative value and the object is also on the left side of the pole so it is also negative so f is equal to minus 24 u is equal to minus 12 and we need to find v that is image distance and m that is the magnification now let us write the mirror formula that is 1 by f is equal to 1 by v plus 1 by u 1 by f f means minus 24 so 1 by minus 24 is equal to 1 by v plus 1 by minus 12 because u is minus 12 now 1 by 12 minus 1 by 24 equal to 1 by v here 2 minus 1 by 24 is equal to 1 by v so here v is equal to 24 cm that is positive 24 cm so we found the value of v that is the image distance 
Now we have to find out the image height. To do that, first we need to find out the magnification. So now let us find the magnification of the image. Magnification formula is m is equal to h dash by h. h dash is height of the image by h is that height of the object. But here we don't know the height of the image. So we use the other formula that is minus v by u, image distance by object distance. So now we know both the values, image distance and object distance. Let them substitute here. m is equal to minus v, that is image distance in negative value, minus 24 by object distance, that is minus 12. So minus 24 by minus 12, that is 2. So the magnification of the image is 2. That means that the image is two times bigger than the object. Now let us find the image size. For this we take the formula m is equal to h dash by h. h dash means height of the image. So we need to find out that. Then h is 6. And we know the magnification that is 2. Now let us substitute these values. Magnification is 2. So 2 is equal to h dash by h is equal to 6 we know. So 2 is equal to h dash by 6. Then h dash is equal to 6 into 2. It is 12, 12 centimeters. So the image height is 12 centimeters. Now let us know the nature and position of the image. We know that if the position of the object is between P and F, that is between the pole and the focal length, then the image will be virtual and upright. So in our problem, the nature of the image will be at this point. 24 centimeters away from the pole with a height of 12 centimeters. So we find the position of the image 24 centimeters away from the pole towards right and nature of image virtual and upright and the size of the image is 12 centimeters. Refraction of light. Refraction is the change in the direction of light passing obliquely from one medium to another medium. Refraction occurs due to change in the speed of light as it enters from one transparent medium to another. The speed of light is more in air, whereas the speed of light in water is less compared to air. So the light ray, when it enters from air to water, it bends towards the normal. The refracted ray is closer to the normal when compared to the incident ray. In our day-to-day -day life, we see different phenomenon like pencil appears displaced when it partly immersed in glass of water. In the same way, a lemon kept in water in a glass tumbler appears to be bigger than its actual size. The letters appears to be raised when seen through a glass slab placed over it. These are all because of refraction of light. These observations tell us that light does not travel in the same direction in all media. Refraction through a rectangular glass slab. Let us take a glass slab and pass a light ray obliquely from one of its side. The light ray bends towards the normal and when it emerges out from the glass slab, it bends again and moves away from the normal. Here we can observe that the angle of incidence at the air glass interface is equal and opposite to the angle of emergence at the glass air interface. This is why the emergent ray is parallel to the incident ray. Loss of refraction of light. One. The incident ray, the refracted ray and the normal to the interface of two transparent media at the point of incidence all lie in the same plane. 2. The ratio of sine of angle of incidence to the sine of angle of refraction is a constant for the given pair of media. This law is also known as Snell's law of refraction. If I is the angle of incidence and R is the angle of refraction, then sin i by sin r equal to constant. Refractive index. The refractive index of a medium is a measure of how much the speed of light is reduced when it passes through that medium compared to its speed in vacuum. It is a dimensionless quantity and a higher refractive index indicates a slower speed of light in that medium. Light travels faster in vacuum with a speed of 3 into 10 to the power of 8 ms to the power minus 1. In air, the speed of light is only marginally less compared to that in vacuum. It reduces considerably in glass or in water. The value of refractive index for a given pair of media depends upon the speed of light in the two media. 
a ray of light traveling from medium 1 into medium 2. Let V1 be the speed of the light in medium 1 and V2 be the speed of the light in medium 2. The refractive index of medium 2 with respect to medium 1 is given by the ratio of the speed of light in medium 1 and the speed of light in medium 2. This is usually represented by the symbol N21. This can be expressed as N21 equal to speed of light in medium 1 by speed of light in medium 2. That means V1 by V2. The refractive index of medium 1 with respect to medium 2 is represented as N12. It is given as N12 equal to speed of light in medium 2 by speed of light in medium 1. That means V2 by V1. If medium 1 is vacuum or air, then the refractive index of medium 2 is considered with respect to vacuum. This is called the absolute refractive index of the medium. It is simply represented as N2. If C is the speed of light in air and V is the speed of light in the medium, then the refractive index of the medium Nm is given by Nm equal to speed of light in air by speed of light in medium, that is C by V. Different materials have different refractive indices. For example, the refractive index of water is approximately 1.33, while the refractive index of diamond is approximately 2.42. Now let us see the refraction by spherical lenses. A transparent material bound by two surfaces of which one or both surfaces are spherical forms a spherical lens. They can be either convex lens or concave lens based on their shape and refractive properties. A convex lens also known as converging lens. It is a transparent material with curved surfaces. It is thicker at the center and thinner at the edges. Convex lenses are designed to converge or focus parallel incident light rays to a single point called the focal point. A concave lens also known as diverging lens is a transparent optical device with curved surfaces that curve inward like a cave. Concave lenses are thinner at the center and thicker at the edges. These lenses are designed to cause parallel incident light rays to diverge away from the virtual focal point. A lens has two spherical surfaces. Each surface forms a part of a sphere. The center of these spheres is called center of curvature. Principal axis. An imaginary straight line passing through the two centers of curvatures of a lens is called its principal axis. Optical center O. The central point of a lens is called optical center. Aperture. Effective diameter of the circular outline of a spherical lens is called its aperture. Principal focus F. The point where the rays parallel to the principal axis meet after refraction is called principal focus. A lens has two spherical foci. Focal length F. The distance of principal focus from optical center. Rules for the ray diagram of spherical lens. A light ray which is parallel to the principal axis after refraction will pass through the principal axis in case of convex lens and will appear to be coming from principal focus in case of concave lens. Light rays passing through the convex lens or directed towards the focus in concave lens will emerge parallel to principal axis. A ray directed to the optical center will emerge out undeviated in case of both convex and concave lens. Image formation by convex lens. Case 1. If the position of the object is at infinity, the position of the image will be at the focus F2 and the relative size of the image is highly diminished and point sized. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 2. If the position of the object is at beyond 2 F1, the position of the image will be between F2 and 2 F2. The relative size of the image is diminished. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 3. If position of the object is at 2 F1, the position of the image will be at 2 F2. The relative size of the image is same. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 4. If position of the object is at F1 and 2 F1, the position of the image will be at beyond 2 F2. The relative size of the image is enlarged. The nature of the image is real and inverted. Case 5. If position of the object is at focus F1, the position of the image will be at infinity. The relative size of the image is infinitely large and highly enlarged. The nature of the image is real and inverted. 
केस सिक्स इफ पोजिशन ऑफ द ऑब्जेक्ट इज बिटवीन फोकस एफ वन एंड ऑप्टिकल सेंटर ओ द पोजिशन ऑफ द इमेज विल बी ऑन द सेम साइड ऑफ द लेंस एज द ऑब्जेक्ट द रिलेटिव साइज ऑफ द इमेज इज एनलॉज द नेचर ऑफ द इमेज इज वर्चुअल एंड एरेक्ट लेट एज नाउ स्टडी द नेचर पोजिशन एंड रिलेटिव साइज ऑफ द इमेज फॉर्मड बाई ए कॉन्केव लेंस केस वन If position of the object is at infinity the position of the image will be at the focus f1 the relative size of the image is highly diminished and point sized the nature of the image is virtual and erect case 2 if the position of the object is between infinity and optical center o of the lens the position of the image will be between focus and optical center o the relative size of the image is diminished the nature of the image is virtual and direct sign convention of spherical lens the sign convention of the spherical lens is same as the one used for spherical mirrors we apply the same rules for signs of distances except that all measurements are taken from the optical center of the lens in the sign convention of spherical lens the focal length of a convex lens is positive and that of a concave lens is negative lens formula this formula gives the relationship between object distance u and image distance v and the focal length f the lens formula is expressed as 1 by v minus 1 by u equal to 1 by f the magnification m of a spherical lens is a measure of how much the lens magnifies or reduces the size of an object as it forms an image magnification is calculated using the following formula m equal to h dash by h magnification is represented by the letter m If h is the height of the object and h dash is the height of the image given by a lens magnification produced by a lens is also related to the object distance u and the image distance v this relationship is given by m is equal to h dash by h equal to v by u where m is the magnification of the lens v is the image distance means the distance from the lens to the image and u is the object distance means the distance from the lens to the object power of lens the power of a lens is a measure of its ability to bend light it is represented by the letter p the power p of a lens of focal length f is given by p equal to 1 by f the power of a lens is measured in units called diopters d p is the power of the lens in diopters d f is the focal length of lens in meters m positive and negative powers A lens with a positive power is called a converging lens which focuses light rays to a point. Convex lenses have positive powers. A lens with a negative power is called diverging lens which causes light rays to spread out. Concave lenses have negative powers. This is all about the reflection and refraction of light.